Welcome to FBC. Thanks for tuning in. We pray that you will allow God's Word to speak to you, to encourage you, and transform your life. Thanks for watching. My name is Bobby Taylor and I've been here almost a year and a half. My house caught on fire on September the 16th and it burnt completely down. I lost everything I had. We were in bed, it was 5.30 in the morning, and my dog Gracie woke us up, uh, barking and carrying on. Um, I went down, jumped up, and I could see a glow in my living room because my bedroom's upstairs and my lot was in a loft upstairs. So I looked over and I seen this big glow downstairs and I come running down. I saw out the side of the um, window that my porch was on fire. And my husband's son, Colton, which is now 11, he was in the back sleeping and I heard him and I started screaming for him and he was running down, I could hear him and the dogs running down the hallway towards me and they got to the kitchen area and I said, please run, 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 get outside, get outside. He ran out the front door, I made sure he was out with both the dogs. The porch was engulfed by them and I called 911 and I was on the phone with them and I was telling them the porch was on fire. If they would hurry, it wouldn't get to my house. I tried to run up on the porch and go back in the house before um, it hit my house because my Jeep was sitting beside the house and I couldn't get in. The smoke was so bad I couldn't get in with the key to get the key so I lost the Jeep and my house. I didn't know what to do. I was devastated and so many people have you know brought me things and clothes and cards and the church helped with money and, and prayers more than anything the prayers of the church held me together. We have, I go to prayer class um, on Tuesday mornings at 8.30, which I recommend to everyone. We get together and we pray, and I just started going to the class not long before this happened. And I believe that God had put it on my heart because I wrestled with it the night before I started the class. Do I wanna go, do I wanna make this commitment? It's so early in the morning, and I, you know, I have a lot to do because I run my own business. And, and so I said, I'm going, I'm going to obey God, and He's telling me to do this. So I went. And I think that was because God was telling me I would need, I would need these people, I need the, the prayer class to help me get through this. And when this happened, they prayed over me in the class. They've been praying for me ever since. And one thing after another would just happen, miracles and miracles. With people, you know, just listening to my story, I tell anyone that wants to hear me. <laughs> I've been telling them. Um, how God has done this and what He's done for me. And I, they say, I can't believe you're so strong. I said, it's not me, it's God, it's my faith. Prayers made a difference. Prayers made a difference. I definitely am looking forward to the 21 days of prayer. Keeping my commitment, um, being strong, because I believe God's gonna answer lots of prayers, lots of miracles are gonna happen and people will really see it. changed the lives of the people that prayed them. They changed the circumstances and the situations around them. Um, they weren't just at one time period. They spanned the whole course of the Bible. They were all different classes of people, rich and poor and uh, ordinary people. They were offered for a variety of reasons. They were specific. They were very direct. They were offered as requests and not demands. What I did is, is take these 21 prayers, I printed them out, and I began to pray them every day, and I began to see God answer these prayers. Well, I shared them with some people, and God began to work in their lives, and um, it's turned into a, a thing right now where, like
like I mentioned at the beginning, we've got over 11,000 people in the United States praying the 21 most effective prayers of the Bible. The first 21 days of the year. <laughs> and so we're inviting you to join with what God's doing. I don't know how many people around the world, at least another five to 10,000. Inviting you to join with what God's doing because we want you to see God do more in you, for you, and through you than you've ever seen before. 21 is, is how many prayers were actually recorded in there. It's interesting. They say it takes 21 days to create a habit. And so we want you to create some new prayer habits in your life in the next 21 days. Uh, we're encouraging you to pray more, to pray longer, to pray more often throughout the day. If you don't pray with your mate, you start praying with your mate for at least the next 21 days. If you don't pray with your family, pray with your family uh, for the next 21 days. If you don't have a prayer partner, come to some of our prayer events or somebody you know and get a prayer partner you can pray with at least some of the days in the next 21 days. Come to some of our prayer gatherings we'll be holding here at the church. Uh, I'll be doing some stuff online. You can join uh, based on your schedule. But I want to encourage you to pray more than you've ever done before. Let me ask you a question. How many of you believe God can do things bigger than you? How about faster than you? How about better than you? Well, if you actually truly believe that, your prayer life should be effective. When you don't pray, you're saying, I don't need God, I got this. And my question always is, well, how's that working for you? So, uh, I want to give you three truths about prayer, and then we're going to launch into some of the most effective prayers in the Bible. The first truth I want to give you is prayer, remember this, it's not dictation. It's not dictation. You're not telling God what to do. You're finding out what God wants to do, and you're cooperating with what God wants to do. Uh, you, you're getting on the same page with God. Jesus taught us the motives of prayer when he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So you're praying things that are going to honor God's name. Uh, thy kingdom come. You're praying for things that are going to advance God's kingdom. Thy will be done. You're praying for things that are going to accomplish God's will. So it's not dictation. It's you cooperating with God to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in these situations. Second thing I want to say about uh, truth about prayer is it's based on what's best. God does what's best. Not necessarily what you want or what you think is best, but God does what he knows is best. For example, my youngest son, Luke, when he was three years old, his brother, older brother had gotten a pocket knife, and he decided he needed a pocket knife. I used to lay down with all the boys every night when they went to bed, and, and we'd pray together. And I said to Luke, I said, Luke, what do you want to pray about tonight? And he said, I want you to pray about you giving me a pocket knife. I said, Luke, well, you know, I love you, and I love your brothers, and uh, we're going to wait until you're about seven because that's going to be the best thing. The next night, Luke, what do you want to pray about tonight? I want to pray about you giving me a pocket knife. Did the same thing over and over. He would ask his mom, who's a softer touch than I am, and she would, she would look at me and she would go, no, Luke, your dad says we're going to wait till you're seven to give you a pocket knife. Well, it just happened that Kathy and her sister had taken a trip to Europe, and Kathy happened to be in Switzerland and happened to be in a shop that was selling Swiss Army knives at a great price. And she said, well, I'll get Luke a knife. He was five and a half at the time. She said, I'll get Luke a knife, and I'll give it to him when he's seven. Well, she got home. She unzipped her suitcase. She was giving the boys the stuff she got them on the trip. And Luke, big blue eyes, said, do you have anything else for me, Mom? And Kathy looked at him. She looked at me. She looked at him. And she handed him the pocket knife. Now, Father had said seven. He was five and a half. Three days later, 
Luke and I were in the emergency room getting his le legs stitched up because he uh, wasn't quite ready for a pocket knife. Now, I don't usually tell that story, but I like to tell it because it's one of the few times where I could say that I could tell Kathy I told this story. But uh, um, the point of that story is this, Father knows best. And uh, our Heavenly Father knows best. If God isn't, you're praying and God's not answering the way you want, when you want, you need to either examine your motives or examine your prayers or realize God's on a different time frame and God does what he knows is best. Third thing I want to say about prayer before we launch in is God doesn't answer if you don't ask. People that never see answered prayers are the people that are never prayed. If you want God to answer your prayers, you got to ask. Seven times in the uh, Jesus uh, gives us the, the admonition to ask him in prayer. In fact, he commands us. He says, ask. That's a command. Ask. Keep on asking, and it shall be given unto you. If you want it to be given unto you, you got to ask. It's, and then he promises, he says, your father is willing to give good gifts to those who ask him. You know, the words used for prayer most often in the Bible have to do with asking. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the original languages, they're all about asking. There's more to prayer than asking, absolutely. I once made a list of 52 types of prayer, but... The primary aspect of prayer is not just talking with God, but it's asking God for things that you need. I believe that God has something like a, a big warehouse. This isn't exactly true, but it's something like this. It's some, like, something like a big warehouse in heaven with every blessing God wanted to do in you, for you, and through you. But there's a section of that warehouse where these blessings are reserved for you have to ask him. When I get to heaven, I want my warehouse to be empty. I want to have gotten everything God wanted on this earth, in my life, for my life, through my life to others. I would, be rather, uh, I would rather be guilty of asking for too much and not getting it all than asking for too little and not getting all that God wanted to do. So the next 21 days, there's, it's about asking, and it's about asking God and, and talking with God and connecting with God more than you have before, longer each day, more often each day, more often with your husband, with your wife, more often with your kids, more often at church, more often with other prayers going on. Look, it's not going to hurt you, but it certainly can help you. Okay, let me, I'm not going to cover uh, uh, all these 21 prayers the next four weeks, but I'm going to give you three, about three a week that uh, I especially want to hit. Number one is the, the first one in Scripture. I think it, it, it sets the stage for the rest of them, and it is give me success. Now, I started praying through all the prayers of the Bible, and I came to this one. And the background of this story is this. It's found in Genesis 24. The background of this story is Abraham is 140 years old. Now, the name Abram means father. And God said, guess what, buddy? You're not going to be a father. You're going to be the father of many. So I'm changing your name to Abraham. Well, Abraham had a son, but he didn't have any grandchildren. His son is 40 and got no kids. And so let's hold that off just a second. He's 40 and got no kids, Isaac. And uh, Abraham's get, his wife just died. Sarah's just died. Abraham's 140. He's like, I want to see a grandchild before I die because I'm supposed to be the father of many nations and I don't have any grandkids. So he sends his fa favorite servant, whose name is not even mentioned in the chapter. Now, some of you are like, well, prayer's not really my thing because I don't have a big name. I'm not Billy Graham or whoever. Well, at least you have a name. 
This guy's name isn't even mentioned. Because it's not about your name that gets your prayers answered. It's the name of Jesus by which our prayers are answered. So he sends his servant 450 miles back to his homeland. It was a custom. You're supposed to marry a distant relative. She's got to be a virgin. She's got to be uh, willing to come back here, marry a man she's never met, and, uh, and like it. And give me a grandchild. So the servant has this huge assignment, and uh, he goes and he says this prayer. So here's the prayer, Genesis 24, verse 12. Then he prayed, O Lord God of my master Abraham. He doesn't even have his own relationship with God at this point. He says, the God of my master Abraham, give me success today. That's his prayer. Show kindness to my master Abraham. Now, I remember reading this the first time saying, God's not going to give. That's a selfish prayer. You're not supposed to pray like that. Give me success. That's just God going to laugh in his face. Give me success today, and I'm going to tell you exactly what success is going to look like, God. Verse 13, I'm standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the town people are coming out to draw water. So where are you going to meet women in, uh, you know, 3,500 years ago, you, you didn't go to the bar, you went to the well, you went to the spring where they all came out uh, at certain times of the day to get water. He said, may it be that I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink, the special girl, <clears throat> I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you've chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you've shown kindness to my master. He says, give me success today. It's specific. It's targeted, it's, it's definite, and so he's given God a target to hit. Well, did God like this prayer? Did God answer? Did God laugh in his face? No, God said yes. Look at this, verse 15, I love this. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. He's not even done praying, and God's already sent her. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. That means she was a distant relative, a second cousin. I, I made a joke one time about, you know, the, I was preaching in West Virginia, and I said, most of us don't ma marry second cousins except here in West Virginia. And they, they didn't like that very much. Uh, very, she was very beautiful. Hey, cha-ching. She was a virgin. Hey, cha-ching. Uh, she went down to the spring, filled her jar, came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, hey, please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my Lord. Cha-ching. And she lowered her jar uh, to her hands and gave him a drink. And after she had given him a drink, unprompted, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too. Cha-ching. God sent the answer. Yay, God. And uh, the rest of the story is, she was willing to go with this guy she never met, 450 miles to marry a guy she never met. He loved her. They had children, and she became, get this, great, 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 a bunch of great grandma to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Well, I love this story because... When I was first doing this, give me success, okay, I got an assignment, I need God to come through, um, and I was reading Luke 11 where it said the guy went and knocked on the door and said, give me three loaves of bread, specifically three loaves of bread. Well, I had a problem, I was, a, I was in college, and I was going through college by faith, I didn't have any money, my college, very strict at the time, they had a tight hair code, which used to be a problem for me, and uh, so you had to have your hair cut uh, a certain shortness, my hair grew very fast, all my thick, luscious hair. It was growing very th fast, and so I, my RA, my resident assistant over at my dorm, was a Marine, and he also was a jerk, and he said, look, you, you got to get your hair cut to, by tomorrow at this time. It's got to be in code, or you're spending the weekend here at campus with me. I'm like, I don't want to spend the weekend with you. Didn't have any money. I did not trust any of my roommates with scissors or anything like that. 
I said, God, I need a haircut. It's got to be within 24 hours. It's got to be free. And I'd like it to be good. Have you ever prayed and God's like, okay, I got this. You ever prayed and felt that? That's how I felt. I went to sleep, woke up the next day, forgot about it. Eating dinner in the cafeteria. Some guy I didn't know very well ends up sitting across from me. There's a girl. It's the beginning of a new semester. Girl sitting with him. Uh, he introduces her as a girl from his church. I said, well, hey, do you like, do you like uh, Liberty? And she said, well, you know, not really. I really enjoyed the school I was at. I said, what was that? She said, well, it was cosmetology school. I was, uh, I, I was learning to cut hair. She said, I was just about ready to graduate. And my dad said, I needed to come to a Christian college for a semester. And then she said this. This is the truth, okay? She said, you know, I really miss cutting hair. Then she said, this is the truth, you have a lot of beautiful brown hair. She said, would you mind if I cut your hair tonight and I'll do it for free? Cha-ching. Yay, God. You see, God is good. God loves you. God likes to answer our prayers, but he doesn't answer if you don't ask. Give me success, and God gave me success in that venture. I want you to start praying, God, give me success in growing my prayer life. Give me success in growing the prayer life of my mate and I. Give me success in growing the prayer life of my family. Give me success in, in, in this assignment that you've given me. Pray for the other churches around the world. I've got churches that have never done any sort of prayer emphasis at all in the U.S. And it's like, guys, you can do this. Just encourage your people. Find the ones that love God and, and really just get together with them and pray. Well, there's a second prayer I want to give you. Give me success. And the second one is bless me. Bless me. Jacob. Jacob was a mess. This guy, you know, he, he was a, a kind of a thief. He was a taker. He was a con man. His, his name, Jacob, means grasper or taker. And he had a brother, Esau, older brother, Isaac, the, the, um, their father, supposed to give the birthright blessing to Esau, and Jacob stole it from him. Okay, Esau was a big, hairy, violent, aggressive mean guy. And he told his brother Jacob, look, I'm not going to bother you now, but when dad dies, I'm killing you. Dad had just died. Esau is coming. Jacob gets word Esau is coming, and he's got 400 men. And Jacob, what do you do when you're desperate? What do you do when you're desperate? You pray. So for maybe the first time in this dude's life, he is praying. And he gets in this, this uh, all-night wrestling match with God. I don't know if you've ever been in a wrestling match with God. This is like a literal wrestling match with God. And he gets a hold of God, and he is tenacious, and he will not let go. And in Genesis 32, 26, the man says, Let me go, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, I remember reading that going, God's never going to answer that. That's a terrible prayer. That's selfish. Bless me. Why would God answer that? Well, God did. I'm not going to go through it all, but God gave Jacob a plan of how to approach Esau by sending him gifts and not taking from him, but giving to him. God gave Jacob a, a whole new name. Changed his name from Jacob, grasper, taker, to Israel. That's where that name came from. The name means prevailing prince with God. He got a new nature. He went from being a taker to a giver. He's giving to Esau gladly. And God is blessing him to bless others. Uh, and so when Esau arrives, instead of running up and killing him, Esau runs up and hugs him. And he's like, it's all forgiven, all forgotten. Yay, God. God blessed him. 
You know, I, I, the way I understand the, the way you pray this prayer is God bless me so I can bless other people. God, the point is, I want you to bless me so I can bless other people. Jacob became a blesser of others. Israel became a blesser of others. Israel has blessed the whole world, the nation of Israel. So when I start praying this prayer, God bless me so I can bless others, guess what? When you pray it with that attitude, God says yes. I'm going to give you one example. When I wrote this book, I prayed, give me success in writing this book. Bless, bless this book to bless a lot of people. Bless me to bless a lot of people. Well, it, I've written a couple other books, sold a couple thousand copies. When I wrote the, the proposal for this book, it was rejected 21 times. Think about that. And I said, God, I believe you're supposed to bless, you, you want to bless this book. And I, I modified it a little bit. When, it's, when it was published, it took off. And all of a sudden, it's selling in airports, gift shops, bookstores, Barnes & Noble, Walmart. In fact, Kathy had an uncle. I don't know. He, not, a, not a big construction guy, not a, not a God type of guy at all. Got cancer, went to Walmart, found this book and another book I'd written about bad things happening to good people. Said, I think I know that guy. Started reading the book, called me up, and I got to lead him to Christ. God blessed me to bless him. Think about that. Over the next uh, 15, 16 years, this book sold over 300,000 copies. I have, I have a, a chapter in there on how to get saved, essentially. And uh, pe I say, send me an email. And people start sending me emails. I started getting emails from people all over the country, people who, who had relatives healed, had families restored. God used them to impact other people. This is God doing this, not me. This was God blessing to bless others. I, uh, when COVID hit, I, I went to kindergarten. Me and this other kid were the two smallest kids. We became instant buddies named Kevin. Buddies all the way through school. We played sports together. Kevin's my buddy. Well, life goes on. Kevin goes through a lot of stuff. COVID hits. For some reason, he puts on our live stream of, the, of our Sunday service and rededicates his life to Christ. Kevin and I reconnect after years and years and years. Well, Kevin is on fire now. He's a medical doctor. He texted me this week, and this is what he said. He said, I keep praying for one more, and God keeps giving me one more person to give the book to. When God starts to move in your life, he showers you with people who need a message. God is opening so many doors for me right now since I started praying every day. Handing the book out has been a great avenue for me to witness. It's how I witness. It's a great tool for me to hand out at work. He's a doctor. He prays with his patients now or in a coffee shop or wherever. God blessed me to bless him. He said, um, or he, he keeps going on just about people he's getting to share the gospel with. And his way of witnessing, he says he gives them this book. He just says, let me give you a book. And... Uh, I am blessed because God is blessing him to bless a lot of other people. Eleven months ago, eleven months ago, almost to the day, I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, speaking at a pastor's conference, and the guy hosting the conference came up to me at the break, and he said, your book, 21 Most Effective Prayers, just went out of print. He said, I wanted to do that book with my church next January, this January. Next January, 11 months ago, he said this. He said, but I can't find them anywhere. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I, I got the rights to it. I'll get it reprinted. And um, your church, how about your church and my church does this together? He said, sounds great. Well, by the end of the week, I was at another pastor's conference. By the end of the week, there were seven churches. I'm praying about it. God said, ask for more. By the end of the next week, 21 churches. I'm not kidding, 21 churches. God said, ask for more. 
I, I would pray. I, I made a few calls. I sent a few uh, emails out. I put it in some of my, my videos. Today, 635 churches. Now, I didn't do this. God did this. Some of you are like, well, Dave's just bragging. I am bragging on God. Amen. So, you know, I'm here to tell you God does stuff. If you don't see God doing anything in your life, why is that? Because if you believe, and he says, ask and it shall be given unto you. I want to encourage you. It's not about you. It's about God working in you and for you and through you to other people. So he gets the glory. Yay, God. These are, I want to hear your stories. By the end of the month, I don't want to be telling my stories. I want to be telling your stories. Last one I want to give you is remember me. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hannah says, In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord, and she made a vow saying, O oh Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and do not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. You say, what is that all about? It's all about this. Back in Israel, 3,000 years ago, if you're a woman, your prestige, your protection, your provision was all based on you having children. Hannah had no kids. Her bi she's older. Her biological clock is either almost done ticking or it's past time. She's desperate. She goes to God and says, God, I've been coming to you for whatever, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, and I got no kids. God, remember me. And she says, I don't want just a baby. I want a son. And I believe if you really study it, she wants a son who's going to be used of God in a great way because eventually she gives him back to God. You see, she has little influence to change a nation. Her nation is going off the rails spiritually. She says, God, give me a son, and she's wanting a son who can call the nation back to God. Remember me. You say, that sounds selfish. God didn't think so. God answered her prayer. It says in, uh, well, let, let me give you the aspects of her prayer. I'm sorry. First of all, her, her motives were pure. She said, God, if you give me a son, I'm going to give him back to you, okay? It's not about me. It's about you. You give me a son, I'll give him back to you. Number two, she was, uh, her faith was persistent. She's going to keep coming over and over. Year after year, she would go to Shiloh, which is where they were supposed to meet with God, and she would pour out her heart to God. I'm sure every day she would pour her heart out to God. Remember me, God. Don't forget me, God. I believe you want to do this. The third thing about her, motive, her, her prayers are that it was agonizing and earnest. It was agonizing. It was earnest. This was deep. These were deep heart desires. Look at me for one second. I think every person in this room has some deep heart desires that God has written into your heart. And God is wanting to fulfill. He's not only given them to you, but he wants to give them to you. He's not only put it in you, but he wants to give it to you. And she's got that desire to have a son who's a boy who's going to grow up to become a man who will make a difference. She says, I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been dr drinking wine or beer. I'm not drunk. I'm serious. I'm pouring out my heart to God. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. She was desperate. Last thing I want you to see, her prayer was aided by fasting. We find out that she hadn't eaten. She was fasting. You know, I, I found that with the people really serious, they start fasting. Either they, they can't, they're so distraught that she, they can't eat, or they're so determined they won't eat. But if they really want breakthrough, they start fasting. The word fasting in the Bible means abstain from food. You know, it's not like, well, I'm going to not eat vegetables for the next year. 
Now, you can do those type of fasts. Uh, when I do a longer fast, I, I've told you, I, I have juice or I'll have a, a all fruit smoothie or an all vegetable smoothie just so I can keep my schedule, keep going. But I'm fasting. I'm taking more time to pray. I'm, 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 I'm wanting God to know that I am serious about what I'm talking about. I want, I want to clear off the, any fog in my life. I want to focus. I want to see God do a breakthrough. Look, there are some of you in this room, some of you listening online, you've got a thing in your life. It is deep. It is hard. It is difficult. It's breaking your heart. I am telling you, if, if you really want to see God work, start fasting, praying until something happens. And I can tell you this, generally, I don't see the answer when I'm fasting. I see the, the fasting, I get a point where it's like, okay, I've heard, God's like, I've heard you, I'm working on my schedule now, and I see the answer afterwards. I tell you, there is power in prayer and fasting. Jesus said some of these things aren't going to happen except by prayer and fasting. Look, you've lived your whole life, and you've not seen God do a God thing. Well, I'm telling you, now's the time. Now's the place. This is your opportunity. Don't miss it. Get in on it. Let God do what God can do. Let God be what God can be, who God is. Remember me, and God says, verse 19, Early in the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and went back to their home at Ramah and Elkanah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son, and they named him Samuel, the God who hears. God hears. By the way, I've got a granddaughter named Eliana which is the female way of saying God has heard. And by the way, some of you have prayed about that. Eliana is here at church right now. Give it a clap. Yay, God. God hears and answers prayer. I gave, this, I gave a sermon on Hannah several years ago, and I said, you know, our church is doing eight days of fasting. And I call you, if you've got a big thing in your life, a burden, I call you to eight days of prayer and fasting. A lady named Rhonda. Rhonda had just really come back to God in that year through her son. Rhonda came back to God. And she had an a, a, a adult daughter named Megan. She hadn't heard from in months. I mean, she, didn't know, she hadn't heard anything from her in months. Rhonda had never fasted. She started fasting Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night. Her phone rings. She picks it up. The voice on the other line says, Mom, this is Megan. It's about time we got together. She gets together with Megan that weekend. They reconcile. Megan starts coming to church. She, Rhonda kept praying. She started praying about Megan's spiritual life. She comes to church. She gets saved, and I'll, I'll not forget the day I baptized Megan. And I, I, that's because I believe Rhonda prayed, God, remember me with prayer and fasting. Look. God's going to answer. God's going to work. God's doing stuff all over the world. You got a choice, my friend. Either get in on it or miss it. Keep doing what you're doing or get in on what God wants to do. I know where I want to be. Well, let's bow our heads. With our heads bowed just for a moment, I wonder who would uh, raise their hand and say, you know what, okay, God, I thank you for talking to me. I hear what you're saying. My answer is yes, I am in. I'm going to be praying more or praying more often or praying more fervently or 
praying with fasting. Whatever it is God's saying to you, you say, my answer is in. Just put your hand up really high. All over this room, my answer is yes, I am all in on this. Just hold it right there. Say, God, give me success in this venture right now. You know what you put on my heart? Give me success to do my part so you can do all that you want to do, so that you can get all the glory you deserve, so that your name can be lifted as high as possible. My answer is yes, God. It's yes. I just wonder how many of you would raise your hand right now and say, I'm praying for these 635 churches around the world that God would do some great miracles in those people's lives. Just hold your hands up real high. Say, I'm praying for those people. I'm praying God will bless them. Give them success, God. Do some great things. Thank you, God. You may put your hands down. In a moment, I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to stand and sing a song. And we've got altars here in this auditorium. If you'd like to come and kneel, make a commitment to God. If you'd like to come and kneel and receive prayer, we have people that will pray for you. You got something burning in your heart and you'd say, pray with me. Two or more are gathered in, in his name. God, you, it intensifies the prayer. God, pray with me about this. We will happily pray with you. Father, I thank you. Thank you that you do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask, think, or even imagine. That you may get the glory and you may get the praise. God, we ask you to be exalted in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. If you have any questions or comments or if you made a decision for Christ, please reach out to us at info at firstgc.org. That's info at firstgc.org. Thanks again for watching.